Hello, my name is Jason Pomeroy. I'm an architect, academic and founding principal of Pomeroy Studio and Pomeroy Academy, designers and thought leaders of sustainable built environments. When we think of the term sustainability, one often associates it with the need to try and cover and observe and almost react to those socio-economic inequalities or climate change related issues. But what about space? What about culture? What about technology? Increasingly, if we're needing to preserve the needs of future generations, why wouldn't we want to think about how half the world's population are living in city centres? Why don't we think about a spatial sustainability to offset a social sustainability? What about culture? Increasingly, with cultural assimilation, globalisation and technological advancement, we need to start thinking about who we are and where we've come from. A cultural sustainability, if you will. And technological sustainability. What does technology mean to the seven-year-old grandchild and the 70-year-old grandparent? Does technology really enhance our lives? How can we ensure that we have a technological sustainability to ensure that it works for us and not the corporation? Social, economic, environmental, spatial, cultural and technological issues are what we'll be considering today in the context of this conversation with Helen Wong of OCBC. Now, Helen hardly needs an introduction to her illustrious career as a banker and a corporate leader. She started her career as a management trainee for OCBC, being the first China desk manager based in Hong Kong. And over a 27 year period with HSBC, she rose to the ranks of Chief Executive of Greater China. Today, she returns to the fold of OCBC as Group Chief Executive, effectively capping over 36 years of banking and finance expertise. It is with that context and the six parameters that I mentioned earlier that I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you, Helen. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you in person. Naturally, I want to first of all start by understanding a bit more about where you come from. I understand you were born in Hong Kong. Yes, that's, that's Tell me true. a bit more about your lifestyle as a child growing up in Hong Kong, a place which is spatially constrained, lots of mountains, lots of hills, lots of marshlands. And what was it like to grow up in a place like that? Were there environmental issues that you were conscious of from an early age? Um, good questions to start, um, Jason. And uh, indeed, Hong Kong truly lacks space. Mm. Um, the build up, uh, you, you all see Hong Kong, tall buildings. Um, it started really 70s, 80s, so many tall buildings going up. And I remember I used to live in uh, a building without a lift, so I have to walk up to seven floor, but that's already the top floor. Um, but then as I grew up, um, residential buildings went up higher and higher, and they can be as tall as like 80 stories. So it's, it's quite a phenomenon in Hong Kong. But again, Hong Kong offers a lot of nature, Indeed. Uh, if you think about it. So I'm pretty much uh, a, net, uh, a person who loves the nature. So me and my family, my parents uh, used to bring us to hike when we were uh, really small. That's so that point. is something to balance out, I think, the cramped space uh, in living and in the school and in working. So I guess the environment has always been close to your heart. And Very much. It's good to know that because what we'll do, we'll start with the environment as a topic. How important is climate change to you as a leader? And should I say environmental causes to combat climate change as a leader? Well, I think we have to start and everybody is talking about climate change these days, but we start to say that, yeah, we're in a pretty um, urgent state mm. uh, of resolving this. Indeed. And because I, I think everybody, quite a lot of us uh, read the report um, from uh, IPCC yes. recently talking about um, the, the danger if we do not reduce carbon emission. And uh, we're talking about we have to reduce our current carbon emission by 45% by 2030, and then we have to reach a carbon neutral by 2050. Otherwise, I think our planet is not very livable by then. Completely. So it is, it is that important. And so when we look at it, um, I always look at it from an uh, individual 
uh, uh, aspect, mm. but very importantly, uh, what us um, OCBs as a group is doing uh, to combat this. Well, that's good to know. I mean, what is OCBC's green agenda? How is OCBC championing the environmental cause and promoting greener industries? Um, there are a few things that uh, we have to do and we have started doing. Mm. Uh, the first thing is looking at ourselves, right? We mm. are a bank and obviously we help customers um, in managing um, the business, in the financing them, in providing them uh, products and solutions. So that's one part of this, it is uh, how we deal with our customers. Yeah. A second part of this is how do we deal with ourselves. Um, we are property owners, mm. we have bank premises, we have branches, um, we have tall buildings where we put in a lot of people. And then um, the third thing is obviously how you then influence um, your own employees and your other stakeholders. So there are pretty um, three, four pillars to that. Really so if I would go through one by one, uh, we started a few years back. The important thing is we have to start looking at our lending portfolio. Mm. Yeah? And the policy, how do we want to address our lending? How do we steer our customers uh, to borrow in order to make themselves greener? So I think that's a fundamental piece. Uh, we adopted um, our sustainable financing um, framework uh, back in uh, 2017. And lastly, we took on the equitable principles. It is really to assess the risk, uh, the environmental risk, etc., as we lend uh, to a client. So these are important. That's really interesting. I mean, when you mention sustainable financing, I cannot help but imagine the waves of PR literature that yeah. you see within an MRT station, or you open up a magazine, and you cannot help but sometimes get the sense of this green washing. Yeah. of sustainable financing and green financing. What does sustainable financing mean to you as a leader, as a chief executive officer? How can you influence that change of people's mindsets to embrace sustainable financing? Sustainable finance, by the term, it is to enable people or customer mm. to borrow and use the funds to put into use to green, green the environment, right? Or yes. green their operations. Yeah. So that is important because if people have to react and have to conquer mm. the risks of climate change, mm. then you have to start with your own operations. Indeed. So that is something, uh, that's why we said that is important. But of course, there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of times people are saying, uh, is this, you know, overselling it? Or are we overgreening or we are greenwashing mm. um, the whole thing? So you have to be careful as we do this. It is not for the purpose of lending for green. Mm -hmm. It is for the purpose of making sure that the process is really applied to green. So that is the certification process. It is not just a green mark. It is really putting the process in use. That's really good to know. I mean, so many people get so fixated on the product, but they need to realize that in order to get to that sustainable product, you need to have the sustainable process in place to begin with. Exactly. Now, I understand that, and that's fantastic, and I'm sure everybody watching this understands that too. But in terms of ASEAN and the global feeling of where sustainable financing is, why is it more important than ever? Do you actually see that there is this global shift towards sustainable financing? Do you see it happening more in the West, or do you see that it's really becoming prominent in the ASEAN region? I think it started more in the West. Mm. Um, there's a lot of reason, right? Um, I think the maturity of the community, uh, industrialization, economic growth, there mm. are many reasons to that. Mm. Um, but Asia is catching up. Mm. And in ASEAN, indeed, this become a very big subject. Mm. And mm. you can just look at uh, some of the things that is happening around in the countries in ASEAN. And we talk about even for Singapore, which is a very advanced market, we have floods. And this is climate change. Mm. And we talk about uh, uh, forest fire mm. uh, in Indonesia. Mm. And sometimes the pollution can be felt even in Singapore. Mm. So this has happened. And not to talk about um, typhoons, mm. extreme typhoons. Um, there was one that hit Hong Kong two years ago, mm. which wiped out 10,000 trees mm. Um, mm. just by one typhoon. Mm. You know, things like that, that yeah. actually has um, uh, generated so much more concern yes. uh, among us. And in ASEAN, um, we have a lot of studies looking at what sort of financing and how much we need in order to keep uh, the economic growth, 
in process mm. without conduit to damage the environment. So yeah. as a corporate leader, as chief executive of, of OCBC, I'm assuming that you are being there at the forefront to lead this sustainable financing agenda. Perhaps you can tell me a bit more about the 25 by 25 sustainable finance initiative. Um, $25 billion target by 2025 seems incredibly aspirational. Are you going to be able to achieve it? Tell me a bit more about it. I think the start was actually 10 billion okay. uh, back in 2018. Okay. But we surpassed that last year. So, so we uh, were supposed to reach that in 2022. So no shrinking violet. Um, <laughs> yeah. And last year we decided that we surpassed the 10 billion already before mm. Shaju. So we said uh, we fixed this target or we say we want to do 25 by 25. But just want to tell you that by the end of last year, we already passed 20 billion in commitment. That's so um, and this year we continue to see a lot of drawdowns and new interests. Um, we have to probably soon put up a new target that is aspirational. That is remarkable. But is this just geared towards those large corporations or can the SMEs also be a part and parcel of this story? Why is SME financing so important? What are the benefits that we can see by sort of streamlining and supporting SMEs within this kind of environment, this sustainable financing You're right. environment? Uh, this, this whole thing is very important, not just big corporates, SMEs, mm. and also individuals. Yeah. We, we can go through everyone, but you talk about SME. Mm. I want to say, uh, uh, simply put, SMEs are very important because they are they they have the most employees. If you talk about em employment, mm. SME provide the largest employment number, and uh, what they do touch on many things because SMEs are generally uh, on the end of the supply chain. Mm. They supply and eventually the supply chain go all the way to big corporates. Mm. So if SMEs can do something green, mm. it impact the whole. Uh, supply chain, mm. right? So, and a lot of them are also involved in dealing with individuals mm. on the retail front. Mm. So, if you are doing something green, you send out that message, and your customers, as an SME, if you are in retail, let's say um, um, as a restaurant, you encourage your customer to do something similar with you as well. So, for this particular segment, uh, last year we uh, created what we call uh, SME Sustainability Financing Framework. This is important. The reason is, SME always say they are small. If they have to pay the cost for certification, mm. it's actually quite difficult for them. Yes. So what we're doing is, if you meet certain criteria and you fit this framework, you don't need to pay those costs. This is automatically uh, deemed green in the financing. And this is approved by uh, the MAS. That's very good. So we have been helping quite a number of uh, SMEs and by now, only within less than a year, we have done over 100 cases and over $200 million of, of drawdown on these uh, uh, on uh, sustainable financing by the SMEs. That's very good. Yeah. It's interesting that you mention MAS, and MAS is taking active steps to promote more sustainable practices. What are some of the areas for financial services in general to exact that positive environmental change? Do you feel that OCBC are again leading by example? Yeah, I, I think we are seeing that uh, uh, in the beginning of the conversation about what we do in looking at lending policies mm. and how we want to actually shape and guide our mm. own behavior. Mm. And uh, there, there are two things I want to mention. Um, the first thing is uh, we'll be um, publishing the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, okay. TCFD, to be, okay. to be simple. Okay. So we are doing our, uh, our pilot report this year. And inside the report, we're going to disclose how we emit carbon ourselves, uh, what are our policies, and how do we measure. I think only when you can measure, then you can manage. Indeed. If you don't even know what you're doing to the environment, you cannot manage. Absolutely. So I think this is a very important point it is. Uh, in case. Um, and then we continue to, as we said, think about products, uh, think about how we serve our customers, uh, like um, uh, a couple months ago, we have our first, uh, what we call a green swap. Okay, what is a green swap? It is a uh, hedging transaction uh, we did with customer, but building in with something, if you achieve a certain target on greening your own operations, we will rebate to you certain costs on the swap. That sounds really yeah. encouraging. So we're going to do more of this That's alongside uh, 
the uh, sustainable financing, which we put on our book yes. with the target, and also on the underwriting of uh, sustainable uh, debt. And we also, uh, as a corporate ourselves, uh, we continue to look at issuing our own uh, green debt. And we just did in August a Australian dollar of financing that is going to be used uh, to lend to green projects in Australia. That's fantastic. Well, I can certainly see you doing space or things in the sustainable financing space. It's all very encouraging. I want to change gear now okay. into space, right. physical space. OCBC has, should I say, a healthy portfolio of buildings. What actions are you being taken to try and make these buildings green? And how can you be a force for good to influence those developers out there to also go green? Um, first thing, we look at the building itself. Mm. Yeah, we have, a, as you said, a number of buildings. So we commit to reducing uh, emission uh, by upgrading our system, by um, doing how we um, enable the design as mm. we continue to uh, evaluate how to make the design um, a greener design so that people's flow and when people are in the office, how they utilize the air conditioning, for example, mm. and all these, all these things is important. Of course, uh, using more technology to make our process easier, faster, continue to cut uh, paper usage. And, uh, and also um, we have stopped giving out um, water in plastic bottles as well. So uh, many things that we are doing and we are going to set target on our own journey to achieve uh, carbon neutral uh, in some point of time. In some point of time. In some point I may of have time. to pester on that later. Um, certainly, uh, moving towards a carbon zero future is something that has been touted incredibly around the world to try and ensure a more sustainable future for next generations. And it's encouraging to hear that you're going down that route. So I guess, can you be a force for good and support real estate development? And how can you actually be... I guess, as a leader, a, a symbol to those other property owners, landowners, to be a force for good. How, do, would you say that you're in a privileged position to be able to influence and show the greener path? Very much. Mm. Uh, we just talk about buildings, our own buildings, mm. but uh, we have a lot of real estate customers. In, in using Singapore as an example again, um, the commercial buildings in Singapore um, actually is responsible um, for um, I think real estate is responsible for 20% of carbon emission. Mm -hmm. And th this is already better. Mm -hmm. I think in some other developed country, the whole world is about 30%. Mm -hmm. So if you can green the buildings, you cut away so much um, of the, uh, the energy uh, em uh, and then leading to the carbon emission. Indeed. So by helping our clients to put in a um, sustainable finance framework so that they can borrow and in order to redesign the buildings, build new buildings um, that are green, achieving what we call a green mark, mm. uh, as an example. Mm. And these are all very important. And that's why um, some of you can see that some of the sustainable financing uh, we have done in the past are helping real estate developers um, to change, to mm. change the way they build, mm. to change the way they design, change the way they construct. Mm. And mm. construction has a lot of um, pawns to it as well. The mm. materials you use, mm. the equipment you use, Indeed. as an example. So I think that is very important. Mm. I want to um, go for one more example. Recently, I commit um, with uh, our, our group into an, an area, uh, Tampines, in mm. Singapore, the east of Singapore, um, to have 14 buildings joined for us together um, to use a common uh, water cooling mm. system. Mm. So we are in the neighborhood mm. and we can do that. And if we put our uh, efforts together, mm. we'll be able to reduce something like 17% of the energy. Mm. So that would be like putting away more than 2,000 cars mm. on the road. Mm. You know, mm. the amount of sure. uh, carbon uh, reduction mm. is equivalent to that. Indeed. So I'm very excited to that. And when this proposal came up by the district, mm. I said, hey, this is uh, nothing to think about. Mm. Mm. And in the longer run, uh, by linking into the system, we also save money as well. Indeed. Yeah. I will certainly get to your social purpose. But first, I want to also touch on another pillar, technology. How will technology aid us in the drive to reduce the impact of climate change? And in particular, you know, 
how do you support green tech, green technologies, those entrepreneurs wanting to make a difference in technology? Interesting subject, uh, technology, because for a long time, a lot of people saying that technology consume energy. Mm. Yeah, and so um, it just seems to be, you know, going the wrong side mm. if, you, if you talk about uh, greening the environment or, mm. or conquering climate mm. risk. But it's, it's not exactly like that. First thing, I think there's a lot of technology, technologies move really fast. Mm. So nowadays, the new newer technology uh, actually consume less energy, for, for an example. But I think when we talk about technology, you can also talk about AI, Internet of Things, mm. and, and leading into, for example, data analytics. Mm. And that is very important because you think about data, we own a lot of data of our customers. If you can analyze in a way, you would know your uh, customer's behavior. You can design products that try to change that behavior. And we are a bank, of course, we're talking about financial products most of the time. But financial products, we can go into, for example, individuals. Uh, we have launched our eco suit of, of loans. Uh, we are financing our individual customers in their mortgage, uh, in their uh, EV, if they purchase a EV. Yes. And uh, when they do innovation, uh, in the home uh, to achieve uh, something. And we do that by asking them to measure the utility bills. If they achieve a certain target, we reduce the interest rate. That's really good. So, so this is one part of it, that you can use data to say, hey, what exactly is the product? Mm. And some other corporates, um, you use Philips as an example. Mm. Um, they use data to find out that a lot of the customers actually can reuse certain parts of the equipment they sell to them. And because of that, then they design the, the way they handle um, the, um, the, uh, the design of the equipment so that they can address to a certain parts that can be reused and also can be sold in the secondary markets. Um, I've read it. Um, it applies to uh, something very, very important, an X-ray machine. So I think these are things that technology can help us to do. And again, technology can help us uh, to redesign the buildings and to um, actually control aircon flow, right? Mm -hmm. So when um, you have uh, fewer people in the office, it automatically tune, tune down, yes. you know, your uh, aircon. So it sounds like you're a real advocate for big data being used wisely to enhance people's Indeed. lives, Indeed. and you're there to support those companies who really have a social purpose to ensure that the technology is going to be reducing That's consumption right. and there is naturally economic value in yeah. that which you're passing on yeah. to your customers. Yeah. That's really wonderful to hear. I'm going to change gear again. Okay. We're going to go to society. All right. Because we know that you're doing a lot for society. So how important is it for individuals to embrace climate change action? and sustainability on their own, as opposed to being imposed on by governments and corporations. Increasingly, what we're seeing in the green agenda is often the government dictating how the green agenda should be driven. But how can it be the other way around? How can it be kind of more of a, a people movement? Are you in support of that? Uh, definitely. I still think government's uh, policy is very important. Because you set the policy, um, people in industries and in, in different sectors of, of, um, of life, uh, corporates, you have to follow the policy. Mm. And that is a push mm. for people to do it. For myself, I would always finish water if it's given to me. Mm. Because water is a very precious you know, thing for Indeed. human. And if you waste water, that means um, your water goes somewhere wasted and then you need to continue to make sure that you have green water uh, for, for the society. Indeed. And then again, um, there are other um, things that we do um, as uh, corporate sustainability, mm. projects that we go and finance, mm. encourage people to change their own environment, encourage people um, to um, do things that benefit more people. So mm. it's not just giving money away, mm. but uh, financing certain projects mm. um, so that people can build their life better. Mm. There's recently some, something uh, we encourage. Uh, we are financing uh, families, uh, women uh, who are housewives at home to cook for their underprivilege. That's lovely. Yeah. So they're putting our money in good use, buying the materials, cooking, 
and then helping people mm -hmm. and hope that you continue to pass on that message. Mm -hmm. So this is only one of the projects we we finance. That's yeah? lovely. And then there are, of course, internally, how do we make sure our employees are into this together? Mm. Uh, we recently launched uh, our sustainability uh, sets of uh, training, and I'm going to make certain of them compulsory. That's good to know. <laughs> so that we all need to learn what is uh, climate change. Mm. We need to learn uh, what we can do. Mm. Uh, we need to learn what is uh, good financial disclosure. And we need to learn what is good behavior. Mm. Yeah. So it's good to hear about social purpose happening from the ground up and for you to be able to implement that positive social change within your organization. Yes. And hopefully that will influence others to follow suit as well. Are there any other social platforms and um, social initiatives that OCBC are involved with that are contributing to the community? Um, we, we do in, involve in uh, quite a few. Um, we talk about planting of trees, mm. and that is something we will continue to do. Mm. We don't finish just uh, with the OCBC arboretum there. Mm. And then um, for uh, some other project, we uh, encourage cycling. Mm. Um, OCBC uh, cycling is a big event for us. Um, we uh, This couple of years, it cannot be a big event, mm. but we encourage people to continue to cycle. Uh, this is one part exercise going to the nature, but also uh, reducing uh, driving Absolutely. in that sense. And this is something important to us. We encourage our own colleagues to do it. Mm. And then we port uh, virtually um, of their experience. And I personally finance um, something so that I can contribute as a donation as well. That's lovely. Yeah. That's lovely to know. I mean, it's it's interesting what you're, what you're touching on there is... I guess, a cultural shift in our mindset as to how we do need to be more conscientious of others in our community and also giving back to society. And I guess that leads us perfectly onto the sixth and final parameter chapter, if you will, and that's culture. Banks have historically not necessarily been seen as the people or planet's champion. But I do think that times are changing. Yeah. Banks have done a remarkable job in trying to change perceptions, but through action as yeah. opposed to just lip service. How can we ensure that there is that drive towards sustainability through corporate leaders like yourself and what remarkable work OCBC is doing? I think, first of all, we have to look at the roles of banks mm. in society. Yeah. Um, banks are you know, catalysts of change, mm. because we touch on every aspect of the society. So um, th there are many ways um, for us, as we talk quite a lot on sustainable financing. Mm. That's what we can do, you know, channeling really the funds to finance people to do this. Mm. Um, but uh, we, we also can do many things because we're present in many parts of society. Something as simple as well, digitalizing some of the customer journey mm. so that they don't need to come to the branch to perform their transactions. Mm. Um, saving papers. Mm. Um, for the first half of this year, 98% of our SMEs opening an account of us is online. Mm. So they don't need to provide paper mm. of uh, evidence or mm. records. Mm. And they do it entirely online. Mm. So something like this. So digitalization becomes very important mm. um, for the customer journey and for our own internal process as well. This is uh, another thing because we fix so many customers. Mm. So we are quite different from other corporations because banks, you know, have that nature. You deal with many people. Mm. And then uh, you talk about what we can do for the environment. Mm. And something very particular to banks, uh, we have a program um, that we have to um, um, encourage financial literacy. Mm. So we have our own people going out to teach young children what is money. Mm. Uh, what is the value of money? How do you use it? So that eventually they know how to do it smartly. Mm. And because banks have all these uh, different positions in society, the industry as a whole, um, the Association of Banks of Singapore, we are always together talking about this subject. And we're work working with the authorities, we're working with government. Just very lately, uh, we formed another task force on private banking mm. for green. And you know, hey, why private banking specifically? Um, because private banking manage a lot of investments mm. um, for the clients. And private banks should and have to push a percentage of investments of the client into ESG-related mm. 
uh, investments. I think this is something very important. And as the private banks can come together and talk about this, it can set, again, targets, examples for the way we deal with our ultra high net worth clients, who in a way will continue then to steer um, their own um, work in supporting the fight with climate risk. Wow. Um, Helen, I would like to, I guess, conclude this, I wouldn't say interview, it's been a <laughs> remarkably wonderful, enjoyable conversation with um, a reference to the beginning of our chat where we have effectively seen you bookending your career as a start, first uh, China desk manager, management trainee at OCBC, and now group chief executive officer after an illustrious 36 odd years in banking and finance. What is your vision moving forward for OCBC? First of all, as the corporation itself, and then your own personal ambitions and your public good, your give back to society and the green agenda. What is your vision? Starting with the group, um, we want to be, and I want to see that the group will become a sustainable, leading regional financial corporation. So that we continue to fulfill our vision is to help our customers, mm. help the society to achieve their purpose in a sustainable manner. I think that is very important. Uh, personally, I'm very passionate into sustainability. Mm. This is uh, one of uh, uh, four pillars in our strategy going forward, um, because this is important for the society, for individuals and for the planet. Uh, personally, I want to um, see that the group will migrate and uh, go towards that direction, and that our own people feel that we are proud as, uh, as a banking group that our customer will trust and that they, our customers want to build a sustainable relationship with us into the future. We are almost 90 years old, so maybe in 10 years' time we can celebrate 100 years old with something very special as to measuring how much we have done uh, to reduce our own carbon emission and also how much we have helped our customer to achieve the same. Well, in 10 years' time, I look forward to toasting you with a glass of champagne at that party. Helen Wong, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure talking to you today. Thank you.